approaching flood stage. Thousands are still without power following the horrific tornadoes. Green twisters have touched down just south of town. And now, a rolling motion. I believe we're having an earthquake. I have never before seen such horrific weather. I advise you to take cover The books of Bible prophecy have long been shrouded in mystery. Ancient texts, cryptic numbers, symbolic imagery, all depicting awesome apocalyptic events soon to come. Is it really possible to understand what they mean? What is the mark of the beast? Is it, as some say, a computer chip implanted under the skin, or even something more insidious? And what about the Antichrist? Has this sinister enemy of God already made his appearance? Or is he still waiting in the shadows? Will some terrorist event trigger Earth's final tribulation? Will we witness the horrors of Armageddon and the seven last plagues? What do we need to know to avoid being left behind when the Lord returns? Will we recognize the last days and know what to expect? What you're about to experience will reveal what the Bible really says about Earth's end time events. Join me now as we uncover the amazing facts behind the final events of Bible prophecy. But you, Daniel, shut up the words, and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. The end of the world, will it ever happen? If so, when? This is one of the most important and mysterious questions of all time. The biblical prophet Daniel clearly predicted that just prior to the end of the world, we'd witness a dramatic increase in knowledge. Has it happened? Consider, for instance, how dramatically modes of transportation have changed in recent times. For 60 centuries, man could travel no faster than the quickest horse. Now voyages that once required months are achieved in minutes. In one generation, the computer revolution has brought about mind-boggling changes that our ancestors could never have even imagined. But an even more accurate interpretation of this verse is that knowledge concerning the prophetic books would increase. And as predicted, this has happened too. But the writings of Daniel are not the only ones in the Bible that speak of last day events. What other knowledge could be hidden within the ancient texts of scripture? And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. 
and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. One can quickly look around the globe and see that both political and natural forces have made the modern world an increasingly dangerous place to live. Think about it. Within the last hundred years, the world has had to endure two world wars and numerous other major conflicts, not to mention the rise of international terrorism. Add to this the marked increase in deadly natural disasters, including earthquakes, fires, floods, tornadoes, killer storms and bizarre weather, all continuing to wreak havoc on planet Earth. Amazingly, the Apostle John predicted that another sign of the last days would be man's ability to destroy the planet. In Revelation 11, verse 18, he said, the time would come when God would destroy those who destroy the earth. It's clear that this prophecy has been vividly fulfilled. For centuries, man could do little more than just shoot flaming arrows or lob cannonballs at his enemy. But now we possess devastating weapons that can quickly render life on this planet extinct. In fact, Jesus even predicted that if his coming were postponed, no flesh would survive. Christ warned that we would have to face all these dangers, but they would only be the beginning of the end. Could it be that there's something mankind does to trigger Earth's final events? But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good. Anyone who has lived through the past several decades cannot deny the steady and frightening moral freefall of modern society. Each generation continually pushes the envelope of acceptable behavior. As a result, each succeeding generation operates under a lower moral standard than the one before. And unfortunately, there appears to be no end to this shameful trend. In Noah's day, chronic moral decay led to global destruction from a flood. In Lot's time, the perverted depravity of Sodom and Gomorrah led to the annihilation of these cities by fire from heaven. As it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. And so in our day, could it be that rampant immorality and perversion will once again call down judgments from heaven? Along with society's moral decline, the Bible also warns that in the last days, there will be a dramatic rise in spiritualism and the occult. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. The practice of communicating with the dead, long forbidden by the scriptures, is fast becoming acceptable even in modern churches. Television programs and movies featuring witchcraft in the occult themes have become extremely popular, especially among the young people. In spite of all this rampant spiritualism and immorality, the Bible teaches that where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. And so one exciting bright spot of the last days is Jesus' promise that just before his return, the gospel would go to all the world. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. The once seemingly insurmountable task of communicating the gospel to the four corners of the earth is fast becoming a reality. Through missionaries, books, tapes, satellite broadcasts, and the internet, the gospel work is fast accelerating around the world. The message of salvation has never had wider distribution than today. 
The Bible reveals that we are obviously living in Earth's final days. The increase in knowledge, global instability, moral decline, and the explosive interest in the occult all testify that the end is near. The final signs are fast being fulfilled, but there's more. The Bible also warns that it is these opposing forces of good and evil that will ultimately bring the world to the Battle of Armageddon. At some point soon, some unknown global crisis will plunge the entire planet into the most terrifying events the world has ever seen. For then there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. What catastrophe will trigger this final crisis? And when will it happen? Could it be some devastating act of terrorism? Some international economic crash? Maybe even an earthquake, asteroid, or some other cataclysmic event? Perhaps it's some chemical calamity or deadly biological plague? Maybe even a combination of these disasters? But while the Bible doesn't reveal the exact critical event, it does reveal the dramatic scenes that will follow. Coming up in our next section, you'll learn more about these astounding final events, shocking events, that even most Christians are unprepared to meet. As the Great Tribulation begins, world leaders struggle to deal with the mounting calamities. Meanwhile, those Christians who are true to God experience a wonderful surge of power from the Holy Spirit. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. This great power that illuminates God's people is the Holy Spirit. With a holy boldness, they witness for God, pleading for the churches to reform and calling the lost to Christ. They stand firmly on the word of God and exhort all to repent of their sins and obey God's commandments. An atmosphere of revival moves across the world and the Holy Spirit compels ministers and church members alike to work earnestly for the salvation of souls. As the work of the Holy Spirit becomes more pronounced, occult manifestations also intensify. Deceptive demons appear to many masquerading as loved ones who have passed away or as biblical saints of old. They speak words of peace and hope while presenting doctrines containing dangerous and subtle errors. Of them the Bible warns, For they are the spirits of devils working miracles. As you can imagine, these supernatural manifestations hold great influence with the people and few are willing to speak against them. Up to this point, families and churches have been ineffective in stemming the growing tide of global wickedness. In the midst of this political, moral, and environmental upheaval, people desperately seek an effective way to stem the growing tide of universal immorality. Religious and political leaders urged by suffering constituents call for stronger legal measures to restore godly principles and peace to the land. As a result of this misguided pressure, the government passes laws that directly conflict with the law of God. But this is not the first time in history something like this has happened. You might recall the familiar story in Daniel chapter 3 when the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar commanded all in his realm to bow down and worship the enormous golden image he had forged. However, three young Hebrews knew this command was a direct contradiction to the second commandment regarding idolatry. Determined to remain true to God, they refused to bow down to the statue. The king was infuriated and ordered them cast into a fiery furnace, but God miraculously intervened and saved their lives. And then there's the story of Daniel in the lion's den. You'll recall the king of Persia issued a law that no one should worship any god but himself for 30 days. But Daniel knew that to obey this law would mean that he had to violate God's first commandment. So Daniel bravely continued his habit of daily praying openly to God, even though it put his life at risk. 
Daniel's enemies soon reported this violation to the king, who reluctantly had his trusted servant thrown into the lion's den. But once again, God's power was displayed as he miraculously spared Daniel's life. Likewise in the last days, Revelation predicts that an evil power will compel the governments of the world to enact laws regarding how people should worship God. These laws will outwardly appear to promote morality, but in reality, they prepare the world to embrace the mark of the beast and the Antichrist. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. During this time of mounting crisis, when the world is desperately seeking relief and looking for global stability, help appears in a most startling form. In various locations around the world, the shout is heard, Jesus has come, Jesus has returned. A radiant, charismatic being appears claiming to be the Son of God. An army of news agencies flock to see this supernatural entity perform miracles. They hear him repeat many of the same words Jesus spoke in the scriptures. This event is beamed to the world via satellite, and millions mistakenly believe that his appearance on television has fulfilled the scripture, every eye will see him. Many religions are anxiously expecting a coming savior, and this dazzling being seems to be the answer to their prayers. But the Bible is warned in 2 Corinthians that Satan can even transform himself into an angel of light. Sadly, it's not Jesus the people welcome with open arms, but Satan masquerading as the Son of God. By doing this, the devil is able to unite the people of the world and reinforce his counterfeit system of worship. And so, the devil perpetrates the greatest deception ever carried out on the human race. Satan's deceptions prove to be a powerful motivating force in the world. Most spiritual leaders accept the great imposter as well as the false system of worship he promotes. As global calamities intensify, church leaders believe no time can be lost in compelling the world to adhere to the doctrines of this counterfeit Messiah. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Not everyone is deceived. A few realize the Bible has warned of this amazing deception, and they know the goal of this false Messiah is to lead people away from the commandments of God. But this isn't the first time that Satan has appeared as an angel of light. When Christ was tempted in the wilderness, Satan appeared to him disguised as a glorious messenger of God. But the devil revealed his true identity when he tempted Jesus to disobey God's word. And so once again, using similar tactics, the devil tries to deceive the world into breaking God's law. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. The world is being brought to a time of decision. The false Christ and the global strife are polarizing the world into two distinct groups. Those who follow the Bible and those who follow the beast. Anxiety fills the hearts of people and religion is the supreme topic on everyone's mind. In TV and radio interviews and in court debates, God's true followers are brought before world leaders where they give powerful and eloquent biblical reasons for their opposition to the false system of worship being urged on the masses. The commandments of God and what constitutes true worship are at the center of every discussion. Moved by the Holy Spirit in the compelling biblical arguments of God's servants, thousands around the world turn from their lifeless churches and take up their stand with the unpopular but true followers of Jesus. The question, should we obey God or man, popular tradition or scripture, polarizes the whole world into one of two groups. On one hand, 
are those who receive the seal of God, and on the other hand, are those who receive the mark of the beast. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. This text in Revelation foretells the next event, when every man, woman, child will make their final decision for or against Christ. On God's side are those who faithfully stand on his word in spite of intense opposition. On the other are those who embrace the religious traditions of man. Just as the door on Noah's Ark was sealed right before the flood, so the door of mercy is finally shut to the world and God's grace is no longer available to the lost. The second coming of Christ is imminent. But first, the world is about to experience the most devastating series of plagues that have ever fallen on humanity. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Hope of things getting better is crushed as Revelation's seven last plagues begin to fall on the world in rapid succession. These are the most awful scourges ever seen by man or ever will be. The first plague is an extremely painful and gruesome sore that breaks out and causes excruciating suffering for the lost. Six more devastating plagues quickly follow. The sea and rivers of water turn to blood. The sun is given power to scorch men with intense heat. As plague after plague falls, terror reigns on the panic-stricken peoples of the world. During this time, some of the saved find shelter in desolate and remote locations where they are protected and provided for by God's angels. Others are thrown into lonely prisons. Although seemingly forgotten by man, they are not forgotten by God. God's faithful ones are shielded from the plagues in the same way the children of Israel were preserved during the plagues that fell on Egypt. Now the faithful go through a fearful time of soul searching. Uppermost in their minds is the thought, are we right with God? Ultimately, they find peace of mind by trusting the promises of God. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Persuaded by the false Christ, the miserable lost believe their only hope for relief from the devastating plagues is to eliminate those who oppose them. So the decision is made to search out and exterminate in one day the people of God who stubbornly hold to the scriptures. And so on the spiritual battlefield are those who follow the traditions of men and worship the beast arrayed against those who love Jesus and obey his commandments. This is the final battle of Armageddon. A wicked world has finally reached the limit of God's patience. And it is time for God to step in and rescue his faithful children. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. At the darkest hour, the long-awaited hope of the ages now becomes a reality. The commanding voice of God is heard saying, It is done. The thundering voice shakes the heavens. Then there's a mighty earthquake that signals the approach of a massive heavenly armada. The children of God, so recently pale and haggard, now stand encircled by a rainbow and radiant before their oppressors. Their faces shine, for they know the Redeemer and his vast army of angels are coming to take them home. Behold, 
He is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. This is no secret rapture, as you may have heard. Every person on planet Earth witnesses this wonderful event, and most are terrified by it. The wicked desperately flee to the rocks and caves, trying in vain to hide themselves from the approaching Holy King. And as Jesus promised, the evil men who were prominent in his trial and crucifixion are raised from their graves to behold him coming in the clouds of glory. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. A loud trumpet is heard ringing through the heavens, and the mighty voice of the Savior calls to the sleeping saints of all ages, saying, Awake, 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 ye that sleep in the dust, and arise. Throughout the length of the earth, a great army of saints arise from their dusty beds. They now appear clothed with youthful, glorified, and immortal bodies, without a trace of disease or deformity. Then, those who have lived through the time of trouble are also transformed. In an instant, they are given new, beautiful, immortal bodies. The terrified wicked look on in anguish at the amazing sight. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. With the world convulsing below them, the redeemed of the earth take flight and rise above the destruction. They fly up to join their Savior among the clouds of angels. Sorrow, sin, and suffering are forever behind them. The veil separating them from their Lord has forever been removed, and they behold their God and his heavenly angels face to face. And at that day the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented or gathered or buried. They shall become refuse on the ground. For those left behind, chaos reigns on the planet. Amidst the hurricane of shrieking demons, the earth quakes, oceans boil, islands vanish, and the dark, angry clouds pummel the earth with gigantic hailstones. The wicked who manage to survive these catastrophes are soon destroyed by the brightness of the Lord's presence. Their bodies lay scattered across the face of the ravaged planet. For the first time since its creation, the earth is now completely devoid of all human life. Only Satan and his fallen angels are left to behold the results of their rebellion. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of Satan and bound him for a thousand years. Surrounded by the world they ruin, Satan and his angels find themselves bound on earth for a thousand years. They are imprisoned on this dark, desolate, and abysmal planet. Alone with his demons, Satan must simply wait and ponder his future punishment. On every side he beholds mangled cities, scorched forests, and dry bones, all the terrible results of his war against heaven. Bound, as it were, in one vast bottomless pit, with no one to tempt or manipulate, he is absolutely miserable. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. While Satan is left to contemplate his fate, 
the redeemed enjoy the unspeakable glories of heaven. They each meet their guardian angels who answer their many questions regarding their lives on earth. Then God, in an act of ultimate disclosure, invites them to participate as judges, opening before them all the records of the lost. The redeemed now have the opportunity to see for themselves why certain people they expected to see in heaven are not there. The hidden thoughts of the lost are now vividly exposed, and the veil is pulled aside, revealing spiritual battles that raged for every soul. Even the actions and motives of fallen angels are clearly seen. The open and transparent character of God in this matter is remarkable. As Paul foretold in 1 Corinthians 6 2, the saved participate in the judgment of the lost. Before a single sinner receives his final punishment, his record is carefully reviewed by fellow humans who know and understand the struggles of life on earth. All the words and deeds of the wicked are weighed against the word of God. The justice of their sentence is affirmed and the degree of their punishment determined. Finally, at the end of the thousand years, Jesus and the redeemed prepare to return to earth. The time has come for Satan, his angels, and the lost to face the ultimate consequences of their actions. Soon the meek will inherit the earth, but God must first execute the final phase of his judgment and purge the universe of sin. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. After this thousand-year Sabbath in heaven, Christ and the redeemed with the New Jerusalem return to the earth. As the city draws near to the desolate planet, Jesus commands the wicked dead to rise from their dusty graves. At his word, the unsaved from every time and place now stand before God. The lost are resurrected with the same mortal bodies they possessed before their death. As Jesus descends, his feet touch the Mount of Olives. A tremendous earthquake splits the mount and transforms it into a great plain. Then the New Jerusalem, the massive city of God, descends from the heavens and its foundation comes to rest on the plain Jesus prepared for it. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations, to gather them together to battle. Amazingly, Satan manages to deceive his followers one last time and he rallies them to capture the heavenly city by force. Generals and military men of all ages now apply their combined skill to prepare for what is expected to be an epic battle. By this very act, the lost reveal that their hearts are unchanged. If possible, they would tear God from his throne and seize the holy city by force. Little do they realize that their futile war is lost before it even begins. Judgment Day has come. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened, and the dead were judged according to their works. Suddenly, high above the city, the Lord appears on his glorious throne. All the feeble war plans of the wicked are immediately arrested. As they gaze up into the face of God, the lost are made painfully aware of every sin they have ever committed. They recall every time they silence their conscience, every time they turn from the pleadings of the Holy Spirit. Some had gone to the grave believing they had successfully hidden their sins of murder, crime, and vice from all. 
with shame they experience firsthand the words of Jesus found in Luke 12. For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. As a vivid panorama of their lives play before them, each lost soul understands completely that they have, by their own choice, rejected salvation. Tragically, the peace and happiness of those inside the city will never be theirs. The feelings of hopeless despair that sweep over them is beyond words. The rebellious can't deny God's justice in declaring them guilty. With one voice they cry out, Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. And falling prostrate, they worship the Prince of Life. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Finally, the time has come for the lost to face the irreversible consequences of their actions. Without warning, fire and brimstone fall from the heavens. The earth breaks up and fire explodes from the molten caverns beneath. And as the inferno engulfs the wicked, the righteous remain safe and secure within the gates of the New Jerusalem. Every sinner is punished according to what they've done. Those with few sins are destroyed quickly, while those who are guilty of horrific evil against humanity suffer longer. And Satan, the instigator of all sin, is forced to suffer the most. For God, the punishment of the wicked is a painful act, but it's something that his justice demands. The penalty for sin is death. On the cross, Jesus suffered this final punishment on behalf of all who would embrace his sacrifice. But tragically, the lost have rejected this gift and must pay the awful price of sin for themselves. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. And as the last embers of punishment grow cold, the citizens of the universe lift their voices and praise God that Satan's reign of terror is forever ended. With the peace of the cosmos eternally secure, God now directs his attention to the creation of a new heaven and a new earth. and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. After the earth is purified by fire, the Lord then takes up his wondrous work of recreation. At the power of his word, the earth is restored into its former Edenic beauty. He speaks, and a carpet of rich, lush vegetation covers the planet. At his command, Land and water again teem with vibrant life. Countless complex and magnificent creatures of every kind peacefully explore the new paradise. The invigorating atmosphere is pure and sweet. The earth becomes one grand showcase of creative brilliance. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. The security of the universe is complete. With the New Jerusalem as their capital, all created beings rejoice under the loving dominion of God. Those who have been rescued from eternal destruction share a special bond with their Creator that no other heavenly beings can appreciate. Yet while sin and sinner have been forever destroyed, one trace of the great rebellion still remains. What happened to your hand? It is the scars on the hands, feet, and side of Jesus. 
as day after blissful day of eternity passes, all sad and painful memories dissipate in the glory of heaven's brilliant splendor. No longer tied to a limited lifespan, the immortal children of God are now free to reach their highest ambitions. The limitless pursuit of knowledge invigorates and stimulates the mind. No longer bound to earth, the redeemed are free to explore the wonders of God's endless universe. Heaven is a place of perfect peace and harmony where love for God and others fills every heart. The Bible promises that this coming kingdom can be your eternal home. Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross to provide you forgiveness and victory from sin. More than anything else, Jesus wants you to live with him in this earth made new. And while he's desperate to save you, he cannot force this free gift upon you. You must choose to accept it yourself. Won't you come to him today? Ask him now and he'll come into your heart.